um, our BRM workshop and concert series. Um, we have started this series, you know, last year in April of 2020, right at the beginning of the pandemic. And uh, since then, uh, once or twice a week, we've had workshops from musicians from all over the world um, and all styles of music talking about their, their process, about their music, about um, their inspirations. And, um, you know, we've really enjoyed this series and we're really thrilled to have Joel Howerson with us today. Um, and before we start that, just a few quick tips. Um, you know, this is going to be streaming. This is on YouTube and you can um, absolutely ask any questions to Joel that you wish. Uh, and I will be kind of scouring the YouTube channel to kind of see if people are uh, having questions and I'll try to do my best to ask Joel. Um, whatever you may have. So feel free to throw questions and comments into the chat and uh, we'll try to get to those. And um, we have a few, you know, cool events coming up uh, July 31st, which we're extremely excited about the Raga Makam project, uh, which is a collaboration of BRM with Amir El Safar. And um, it's a 14 person ensemble exploring the connections between Raga and Makam, Arabic Makam. And uh, we're going to be playing at Lincoln Center outdoors in, um, I can't pronounce the name of the place, Daro Das Roches Park. It's that outdoor stage right outside. What is it? Damrosh. Damrosh. Hey, well, I, I can never say it. I always read it. I'm like, I don't know exactly what it's called. <laughs> Damrosh Park, which is right outside behind Lincoln Center. Um, and big outdoor stage. It's going to be a really great show. So that's July 31st. And we're continuing with this series. So we're going to have... Um, Kauru Watanabe is going to be doing a workshop next week, and Neil Morgai, artistic director for BRM, is going to be doing a workshop as well on throat singing and a lot of the things that he's been exploring, which is going to be super cool. So um, I suggest you know staying tuned and um, following us on Facebook, on Instagram, and um, and on our website where we have our concert listings. Um, so I think that's basically what we got going on. And without further ado, I want to. Say hi to Joel. Hey, man. Hi. How you doing? Great. Thanks. For yeah, it's me. a real pleasure to have you. And um, I've I've personally loved your music for a long time. And uh, you know, we got to hang out <laughs> a couple of weeks ago at a uh, mutual friend Avram at his place, and uh, it was really nice to connect and talk music. And um, I'm, I'm really happy that this this worked out here today. Me too. So you know, Joel's got some you know, really great records out there. Um, and he worked closely with Anupam Shobakar, a Sarod player, and um, they explored maybe some of the connections and, you know, Joel will talk about all this, but um, I think there's a multifaceted uh, guitarist that, um, you know, I think we can all uh, take something from. So without any more, uh, Joel, welcome and thanks for being here. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm so impressed with everything BRM has done. As some people may know, I run the Alternative Guitar Summit, which is kind of an ad advocacy organization for guitar. And so I know what it takes to do this uh, for a community and you've built it in a pretty incredible way. So congratulations, um, you know, are continually in order. <laughs> um, the thing that I thought would be most interesting to talk about given what BRM does is my history of seeking ways to connect cultures. Early on in life, this was important to me, even before I could articulate it. Uh, growing up, I just felt this, this was a natural way for human beings to interact. I grew up in the 60s and 70s. Things seemed much more isolated back then. And of course, the, the interactions between cultures are, are much greater than they used to be. But this inner drive in me, which started perhaps when I deeply studied African music, um, moved to Indian music as well. And uh, growing up playing rock and then learning jazz, I could always hear the connections, but um, I think it's been a lifetime pursuit to understand both the frictions and the commonalities between these things. And 
for anybody who's interested in this type of thing, I would say it, it's such a vast subject. You have to be willing to fail a lot before you come up with something that has the kind of a holistic resonance that um, feels like it gives it depth. I know when I started trying to work with African music and Indian music, it was it was pretty sad, <laughs> you know, um, because I I hadn't sort of in, ingested the different parts of of each of them deeply enough to know how to bring them together, and I'm still learning. And I think it's we're just on the tip of this now. We're just beginning to see what's possible. There are many, many more people doing this. And um, I want to play some examples of some of the stuff I've done with Anna Palm. Um, and I think what I'd like to help people understand and sort of open up as part of our dialogue here is how fulfilling and enriching it has been for me to partake in this process. Because, first of all, it's hard. There are, there are distinct cultures, both fascinating, the jazz culture and the Indian music culture, so deep, so fascinating, a lifetime of work to even come close to mastering one of them. So then one of the questions we ask ourselves is, how deep can we possibly go into more than one culture? And that's been a very profound question for me because I knew early on that just to become a decent guitar player, there was no way I could play any other instrument. I tried to play sitar for about six months and I thought this is just never gonna work. I can't, I can't do both, it's impossible. And um, what I decided for myself and for everybody it'll be different is that my strength was with the pen. As a guitar player, I don't feel that I can execute much in the way of Indian music. It's far too deep and I would have had to spend uh, way, way more time with it on my instrument. So when I found Anupam Shobhakar, I started writing music for him as part of ideas I already had as a jazz composer. In a way, it's like writing a concerto. You're finding a way to use someone and their talents, and if they're open enough, they're interested in what your talents are. And we would spend, literally, we've spent hundreds of hours just hanging around talking about what to do and how to do it, and, and ideas and jamming. We'd just turn on the tape recorder and, and just start to play, and we'd keep moving in and out of these different ragas, and I'd be playing different chords, and we'd go, whoa! Um, <laughs> That was good. Let, let's earmark that and maybe make a piece out of it. And so this process really went on for a couple of years. And uh, at the same time, there was a period in my life where I was really inundating my listening with uh, some South Indian music and particularly the rhythms. And it was just the music that you're about to hear came out of that urge within myself to find new ground, to find new territory, to do what we, we musicians do, find my own voice within this vast amount of music that I was so intrigued by. You know, which started when I, in New England Conservatory, when I was uh, living in Boston, I saw Vilayat Khan play Marwa when I was 17. Amazing. And it just changed my life. It, it, it It's one of those one or two or three or four musical experiences, I still get shivers thinking about it. Yeah. And so uh, let's hear a little music because this has been a lot of generalizations. <laughs> and, and I'd like to just try to talk about how it came together because I think that's the fascinating part. I think as if, if <laughs> this is our small con contribution to humanity, isn't it? Where we, we find ways to cross cross our borders and, um, you know, love each other with our traditions. Mm -hmm. So on this recording, um, we have the great Kanjira player, Selva Ganesh, Anupam, 
We have, uh, of course, Dan Weiss on drums, who else? Hans Glavashnig on bass and uh, myself on guitar and Ben Wendell on saxophone. This was this massive project I conceived uh, when I got the Guggenheim grant 10 years ago. I wrote the music 10 or 11 years ago and finally recorded it like two years ago. Um, oh, wow. it, it was, I was stretching the whole time. Uh, and Talajan percussion is the other part of this, a four part, four part, uh, four member classical percussion group with a couple of imp improvisers and a couple of non-improvisers in it. So you've got marimba, vibraphone, uh, timpani, uh, hand drums, all kinds of stuff, all coming together. Wow. Um, and so this first piece we'll listen to and then maybe I could talk about it a little. And then um, the second piece is totally different and maybe we could talk about that too. And, you know, I, I feel that this CD is, is like a life life's work for me. This is something, I've, I've done 22 CDs, but this one, I, I feel that I, um, I really got, got somewhere new for myself with this. So not, I, I'm always interested in hearing other people's feedback and what they hear and whether it all seems to come together for them. Right, it's amazing. And uh, you said you released this or recorded it two years ago? Oh, maybe three years ago now, I guess. Yeah, huh. yeah, but I wrote it about 11 years ago. It was just too overwhelming to imagine recording yeah. it. Um, and I wasn't even sure it worked. <laughs> It was such an ambitious project. We played it once live and at roulette. And I was like, well, yeah. I know some of this works, but it's going to take some rewriting. And the studio process was exhaustive. You know, mm -hmm. this is music that really came to life in the studio because live, I mean, think about it, that instrumentation, um, you know, even with the best technicians and, and I mean, how are you even going to rehearse enough? Yeah, and and just you know, getting sound right, getting monitors right, like all that is just a whole another ordeal. I mean, with the, the time you actually play, it's like everybody's well, yeah. Tired. You're <laughs> amplifying a sirode. Let's just start there. Yeah, you know, yeah. and the sirode's playing with a drum set live. Right. These are really challenging things that we face. Yeah. Um. So it is possible. That's what I want to say to everyone. It's possible. You guys know it's possible. I don't need yeah. to tell you. But if there's you know, any, I, any, anyone in the audience who wonders whether anything is possible, I say, yes, yes, yes. It's all possible if you spend enough time and, and you really put enough love and heart into it. Yeah, maybe that's the key. You know, that's what keeps you positive throughout the process. And how much did the music change? You wrote it 10 years ago. You recorded it two years ago or three years ago. Did it go through a lot of changes in, in the time between? I think um, it, I just kind of simplified some things that needed simplifying. I fixed some mistakes I'd made. Like there was this one, <laughs> Anupam turned me onto this chakradar that we end the piece with. That's a, that's a thrice repeating line that's sort of meant to be, be the ultimate phrase at the end of a, of a piece. I believe that's a South Indian term. Am I right, Arun? Uh, as I don't know if is... Yeah, well, Corvée, Corvée. Corvée, sorry, Corvée. Yeah. Now I'm mixing up my turns. And, and so <laughs> he, I was one eighth note off and he made me fix that. And I swear to God, it took me 12 hours to figure that out, just how to shift it and make it work. Oh it was, my it was God. like a math problem. Right, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's kind of like a mathematician. You gotta be a mathematician to play this music. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is worse. That's no good here. I don't know who this is. Okay, there's somebody randomly in our meeting here. Okay, so um, this is the YouTube link that we're going to play. Is that correct? The first one, Movement 1. Yes, this is Movement 1 of Still Point Turning World. All right. I'm going to share my screen, and we are going to take a listen. Yeah, we're coming in at about a minute and a half into it, and then we'll, uh, we'll listen for a bit. Okay. Um, you know, I'm just going to double check something. All right, so here we go.
section is in the Malcolm's rock. Okay, so I just want to explain a little bit of that. So that's in the Malkunz Raga, which um, for those of you who don't know, if we're in the key of C minor, which I think we were there. No fifth for you musicians, no fifth, which is so deep. No Western musician would ever write a piece with no fifth that I know of. And that's what's so amazing about that scale. But I, because Anupam's Sarod is tuned to C, as all of you who know ND Music know, it's a drone music where you have one root. I had to find ways throughout the CD to try to change the tonic because yeah. I didn't always want it to be in the key of C. So, you know, a lot, it goes back and forth between F minor which is really a, what Malkunz is in the C, key of C. It's an F minor pentatonic scale. Okay, if you think of F as root, so that that helped me there. And then you know I'll also move up to an A flat major seven sharp eleven, which has all those same notes. I'm cheating a little bit, um, probably as like on the guitar, I'm probably throwing in the fifth here and there, but it's never in the melody. And then, of course, uh, to the C. And so um, the other aspects of that that I think are interesting is you have Dan Weiss playing tabla and Selva Ganesh playing Udu, uh, <laughs> Udu the clay drum. And um, I learned that line from Anupam, the one da, 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 da. sorry for my singing, um, uh, which is, I think from a God, I'm sorry, my memory is failing me, but it's a traditional melody that he taught me when, I, when we came up for the idea of the piece as something to kind of anchor the melodic aspect of it. So, um, I think that, uh, you know, what we stopped right before we both started improvising and trading, um, I think it's uh, eight bar phrases. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that section, so that section continues with some improvising. You also heard some timpani um, breaking up the time on the bottom, doom, 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 fives over the four. Um, all these things that, that are kind of, taken for granted and structured into Indian music time-wise, 
but were relatively new to me and I was experimenting with, you know, fives on top of fours. Yeah. Arun, that's so common for you, really. Phrases of five, breaking things up into fives and sevens and nines. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, having phrases of five in, in Carnatic music, especially, that's a, a, a way to get back, you know, to the downbeat, you know, like things, five has a certain, like, weight that could that it boom you know and then the way it kind of hits back on the one is is a um a common sort of feeling yeah but yeah so the goal though is to make all this transparent so you're not thinking about any of this it's you're just hearing good music yeah so, <laughs> yeah no i love the way this was mixed honestly it's just like it's also when the sarod comes in but you you do hear the temp and you hear this kind of rumble or, or you know and it's kind of in the back but you, you feel it right it, it becomes mm -hmm. a part of the whole um the whole sound and yeah. i think it was it was it was very beautiful and to hear you know kind of like when there's one point where anupam you know hits that fourth you know and then you hear the electric guitar like kind of distorted coming you know right yeah. from behind i'm like man that's that's a beautiful sound together yeah, we we took we we took the liberty of doing a couple of overdubs with that one with the electric guitar. But I was tracking on a national steel guitar. With I wish I had it with me. That was one of our discoveries. Was the national steel blues guitar played on slide sounds so much like a sirode. Wow. And if I had another lifetime, I'd build up more technique on that darn thing and be able to really, you know, <laughs> play it like Debussy or something. But. Um, but, the, but you can hear the little bit that we did, the blend of the sound is just wonderful. Yeah. Uh, they're yeah. both very pointed, but um, rich in overtones. Yeah. Yeah, you can definitely feel kind of the full scope of, of the sound coming, um, coming out of that group. And it is a beautiful, like the vibes, right? Right up front. When we started the track to hear the vibes playing was also, I mean, it's just an incredible tone, but mixing it in, you know, with this group was, um, is, is really great. Hmm. Let's go to about five minutes of something so magical to me happen. And, and this is, again, the magic of this is, is what I want to leave everyone with. When we were in the studio getting ready to record the second part of this, which, which you'll hear where the tempo changes and, um, and we kind of build, uh, kind of <laughs> jam together, if you will, and build. Selva Ganesh offered to do an introduction and then a vocal um, improvisation over the whole, whole thing. And this just blew my mind. I mean, this guy did this in, in I mean, he did a couple of takes, but he didn't need to. Um, it, it was, it was so exciting for me to experience in real time because this this was just adding something so deep to what I had thought of. It, it just took it to a whole other level uh, for me. It was such a thrill. Uh, let, let's 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 play that up. You'll know where I mean. There's a stop in the music and then you'll hear him vocalizing. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what the time code is around a five, yeah. five and a half minutes. OK. Yeah, we're starting a little before five here. Okay. Here
So Miles yeah. Davis, one of his great talents, right, was finding the right people to bring together so something would surprise him. So something mm -hmm. more could happen than he could ever imagine. And that's what I feel that, you know, my achievement was here. I didn't necessarily make a composition with this that was radical. A lot of the, the pieces of the music are fairly straightforward. We're just jamming in 4-4, four, four. <laughs> really. But, but I brought together, uh, I, I put different personalities into one place that hopefully add up to something greater than the sum of the parts. So something exciting and different could happen. And, and that was so exciting for me to feel that as a composer, like, wow, that exceeded anything that I ever I ever even imagined that it would be. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's a beautiful thing. And I think, um, I think I, I certainly felt that quite a bit, um, being fortunate to play with great musicians and they do things that with the music that you might write that, uh, you would never expect you didn't intend maybe even. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's, it's, everyone has their own interpretation. And, you know, I, I feel like that's what is so great about, um, exploring music of different cultures because like a lot of times you know somebody from a different place or that has a completely different musical background or training than you um hears things differently than you you know uh, I, I a quick tangent is um i have you know when i moved to new york city 15 years ago um i went with um you know my friend samir gupta drummer and we went up to Mark Carey, the great uh, jazz piano players. So we went to his house and, you know, we were just jamming and Mark started playing some music. Oh, yo, check this, check out this raga. Uh, you know, I Purya Dana Shri. So he started playing and I was like, I wasn't hearing Purya Dana Shri at all. I was like, I didn't get it. I was just like, what's going on? Like, is that Purya Dana Shri? Maybe he's thinking of something else. So then I asked him, I was like, like oh, how is it? Like, what, what are the notes you're playing? And then he kind of showed me what he was doing. And it was as simple as, you know, um, using, instead of using the tonic as his root, he just like was shifting between the tonic and the, the flat second as his root. And then was kind of like just playing off the flat second too. And it became like super bluesy all of a sudden. 
And yeah. also it was his approach, right? It was like the way he heard it and saw those notes. Mm. I I didn't. So I he was looking at it from this side and I was looking at it from this side. And yeah. I'd never seen it from this side before. Yeah. So it blew my mind, right? I my 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 brain exploded that night. Yeah. And um and from that point on I, I realized, okay, like you gotta be open minded. You gotta understand also that uh that there's more than one way to kind of hear something or play something and nothing's right and wrong in music, you know? Yeah. It's just interpretation. Well, let's take a second to talk about periodontistry because that is one of the great scales. And so one of the things that, that I've tried to do is think about what that's a scale like that means to me as a Western composer. As everyone knows, there's a difference between a scale and a raga. If you're playing a raga, there may be certain notes you're emphasizing. Uh, there's going to be certain tuning that's going to be involved, um, certain key phrases. That's more of the deep information in, in, uh, that's, that's gleaned from the scale. But if you just take the scale, which I did, you can get some incredibly interesting harmonic possibilities. And that, that as, a, as a Western composer, is intriguing to me. So one of the things I've tried to do is, is as a jazz player, well, you know, when we're learning how to play a melodic minor, it, which for you non-musicians is, is this scale. If I'm in C, uh, let's do, I'm gonna be an E. I'm a guitar player, I'm gonna be an E. That's melodic minor. And so what we'll do is we'll learn how to play chord scales. Right? Yeah. In that scale, so that we can be better compers. All right? Well, what if we take periodontistry and do the same thing? So this scale, again, for those who don't know, an E is... That's absent of any articulations. Um, if you take just a scale and you 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 start to play four note chords, you get some amazing chords. Check it out. Okay, for you guitar players, I bet you you've never played that chord unless you were thinking you were making a mistake. You're just barring the first fret and playing the low E, but that's the major seventh, the third, the minor sixth, and the minor second. So that starts to get pretty interesting for me as a composer when I hear the possibilities there. And I actually wrote a whole solo guitar piece using just periodontistry, which, um, which just got recorded. Um, I, I couldn't possibly play it off the top of my head. It's too hard. But um, I tried to, to move the tonic around. For instance, uh, musicians, if you're in the key of E, okay? If you use the bass notes of periodontistry, and I'm just using chord tones now, here are some of the things you, that you can do. You can go from E to F minor. That's a really odd and extravagant move in Western music. That almost never happens. You often go from E major to F major, you know, flamenco sound, Phrygian. But here and now, let's go up to G sharp minor. And here's one of my favorite chords based on B flat or A sharp, excuse me. Okay, that's John McGoffin right there. That's Mahabishnu. That's the type of thing he came up with right? That, that, and something like this. Or from Birds of Fire. So this is all periodontistry, as is this, C minor. So if you go E minor, F minor, A sharp minor, C minor, when did you ever hear that chord progression? So this is material to work with. Um, and then you, you can have things like uh, if you put the major seventh in the bass, 
major seventh, minor sixth, fifth, flat fifth. Wow. So dissonant, right? But yeah. spicy. Yeah. type of thing that I would start doing with Anupam and he'd just start shredding in Pyridonishri and all of a sudden he'd be playing and I'd go to that chord and it'd be like whoa <laughs> yeah it's the miracle of harmony that when you change the root it just sounds completely different totally like you said with Mark Carey yeah That's such an elemental thing that I've done in all my work with him it's to me it's just kind of sounds obvious at this point but it, it can have great results um, in these types of collaborations because it takes it out of that drone space, which yeah, which Indian music is. That's what Indian music does. So, so if we want to take it to a more Western place, then we're going to want to want to seek ways to develop harmonic concepts. Yeah, and and which makes sense. And I think um, I think a lot of raga musicians that are exploring. Um, you know, other styles and kind of creating more contemporary music um, have th this question comes up, right? It's like, do I want my whole record to be in D if I'm a sitar player or if I'm a yeah. violinist, for example, when I do it? So we have to find ways and, and th these are incredible ways. And of course, in jazz and in many Western styles, um, chords and, you know, harmony is a huge part of the music as well right so it's like you can't ignore that and just stay in one space and i mean yeah. i suppose that's the the whole nature of collaboration or a cross-cultural yes. collaboration is about how do we actually tastefully respectfully merge um these styles which retain you know elements that are important to each yes. um but also honor you know something new or, or, or step out a little bit yeah, and I, I had a question for you. Um, you know, we, we were talking about Puriya Danashri. You played those chords, right, from the root, the flat second, the major third, and you were playing all minor chords. Um, did all those chords that you were playing only contain notes that were in E Puriya Danashri? Yes. Yes. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, um, you could play the A major also, a, the G sharp major also, and the C major. You might have to leave out a couple of the notes uh, in C major. You might have to leave out the fifth, but you can allude to it. So yes, um, I want to just bookmark the word honor because you have to honor anybody and any culture you're working with there's no blueprint for that it, it either honors it or it doesn't and i we all develop our meters for that sometimes we hear something that we go i don't i don't hear a lot of respect for one or the other there it just isn't it's not quite getting to that space um and and where that space is it is just we deepen over time it starts shallow when you're trying to do this and you just go deeper and deeper and deeper, hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, and you said you and Anupam had, you played together for a long time before really even writing the music. It was sort of more about an exchange and about learning. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about, about that and were there yeah. anything that stuck out to well, you that like, this wow. Is so, this is, you know, okay, so you got to, I don't know how old the listeners are. I'm 63. When I started thinking about this stuff, I, I, and when I was, even when I was studying with Aladdin Matthew in San Francisco, who's really a guru for this type of music making, um, 
you know, there were no, I couldn't find African or Indian musicians to work with who had any interest in what I was doing. It was a different world. There were traditional players. I'm not saying they didn't exist. I just hadn't found them and there weren't many out there. I know that much. So I might meet someone who is a deeply traditional and deeply skilled player, but they would have no interest in what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. If I wanted to hire them for a recording, they would do their thing on the recording. It had nothing to do with bending to whatever my vision was. And that very much characterizes some of these early experiments. Um, younger generation now, people like you, you, you love many things. You're skilled in Indian music, but Anupam grew up being a heavy metal guitarist. So, and he was, has a deep thirst for Western music. Perfect. And the guy's a virtuoso. So I found like, I, I, like I'd met a, a kindred spirit and we just started to play and have a great time and became friends. That's the only way this could happen for me. Yeah. Uh, he was willing to share stuff that I never would have come up with in the spirit of collaboration. And it was, there were no, there was nothing like you can't do this. You can't do that. There was never, nothing was too holy. Nothing uh, um, was off limit. There was nothing off limits. Yeah. No, that's great. And, you know, I think like friendship and I mean that they go hand in hand with this term honor, which we were talking about and honoring the music is easy to do in a way when you care deeply about the person you're making that music with. Right. Yeah. And then it, and all of a sudden, then it's like, yes, you do care what they think about what you're trying to do with something. Yeah. Um, and, and we and, sit, and sit around that. and I say, look, man, there's no way I can ever play like John McLaughlin. You know, if we involve, Selva Ganesh, what's going to, man, we got to, what are we going to do to make sure that nobody thinks we're trying to be like Shakti and failing miserably? You know? <laughs> and, and th this was a big thing for us. Like, okay, we don't want to try, try to be something we're not. We don't want to do something that's already been done worse than it was already done. So <laughs> where can we try to do something, something new? Will it always succeed? Well, I don't know. Some right. pieces do better than others. I don't think we knocked it out of, of the park on every piece that we wrote together by any means. But each of them, each of them is a very genuine effort to try to take music to an, a new and yet soulful place. And yeah. so um, that's the exciting part about it. Yeah, I, I think it's beautiful. Um, I'd love to hear something else. Let's uh, hear that second track. So this is the, the ultimate piece on the record. That's a 16 minute track that I edited down to about five and a half minutes where you get to hear brief intro where I wrote this enormous drum piece, three minute drum intro, intro that tries to borrow from Carnotic ideas. Mm -hmm. um, then we go into a bit of a melody I'm gonna, you'll hear Anna Palm solo a little, you'll hear Ben Wendell solo a little, Selva Ganesh, Dan Weiss, and then this massive corvée. Corvée, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, corvée. Corvée at the end, which was so hard to play. Oh God, if, you, if anybody ever saw us try to do it live, forgive us. It's really, really hard. So this is just one of these things where in the studio, we were able to, you know, speaking for myself, go in and fix that last part that was so fast. It was really beyond my, almost beyond my ability to play. Uh, you know, but, but just close enough so I felt like I could get away with it. <laughs> that, that's why it's great to be in the studio, right? Man, <laughs> you no, know, I, I just don't want to be ashamed to admit it. it, it no, just, not it, at all. It's the only way this music could come together, but that's, that's been true. Um, you know, when I wrote for string quartet and jazz group, it was the same thing too live it was very difficult to get the balance and you know we didn't have a a lincoln center or um you know carnegie hall to do sound for us this mm. was performed in a club where we had to do the best we could and the strings ultimately often would get drowned out mm -hmm. thank god for recording studios because that's what i'm hearing i'm hearing those balances you want to hear the overtones of the string and the road and 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 all that stuff that makes the uh, the resonance of the music special 
which is very hard to pull off live. Totally. I think I think that's actually one of the biggest challenges is that the instruments themselves, the way they resonate is different in indie music and in jazz or in rock or, you know, to put anything with a drum kit, to put anything with, uh, it just, it doesn't, it doesn't work. Um, so you, you run into those problems. Lose, because it's, yeah. Yeah, you lose also the tuning. You yeah. just do. When you're playing with Western instruments, you're not going to get the subtleties of tuning that that you all will do on your own. And, you know, I, I, I think about that, but I still think it's worth doing, even if it sounds a little bit squashed and tempered and we miss some of those beautiful um, raised and lowered notes that are so much a part of Indian music. Yeah. Well, you know, I saw you, I think you did something at the Jazz Gallery with just Anupam and Dan and Selva Ganesh, right? It was a quartet. That I think you're referring to a gig that Miles was on, not me. Uh, um, oh, I, I thought that was you. I'm sorry. Maybe I, I'm mistaken. Uh, <laughs> but they did a really nice gig song. that I saw on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but that, but there, but there, you get much closer to to uh, to tune, to being able to tune. Yeah. The, le the fewer the instruments, the easier it's going to be. But you know, Miles or both Miles and I are playing fretted instruments. You know, I play slide too, but oh man, that's a whole nother world. And what happens to me is I'm playing slide, I'm like wow, this is really cool. I got to work on this, and then I start to hear harmony in my head. <laughs> And I go, oh man, I, I don't want to try to spend a million hours playing slide because you can't use your other fingers to create chords. So this mm. is just the life of the modern musician. You want to do everything, but you can't. So I play <laughs> some slide and then I can try to work on my tuning with Anupam. Oh, wow. That's great. Yeah, you got to pick and choose, I guess. You do. Um, Okay, so the tune is, is it Devil Mountain Blues? Is that where we're going? No, this is, uh, this would be the one off my website, Still Point Movement 7. Oh, got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the excerpted track. Got it. Okay, I'm just going to find it before I share my screen. And then we will check this out. Number seven. Okay, so... Here we go.
dope. <laughs> yeah. So there were a lot of themes that I tried to come back to there. You know, it started in nine with that drum thing, nine beat phrases that uh, Selva Ganesha solo was in nine beats. It all had this, I was using the diminished scale, mm -hmm. which is a Western, you know, the octatonic scale um, rather than a raga for that. So we were all playing in that. Um, uh, Anna Palm would solo in that and then Ben Wendell and the contrast is just enormous. Um, yeah. You know, when you have somebody like Dan Weiss, who's a kind of a one of a kind player who can go both places, it just, it's, it's just a, a great thing for the composer. And, and there's, there's a lot of, gonna be a lot more people. There's of course, Samir can do that. And, and there's, there's gonna be more people like that. We're, we're just at the leading edge of this, thing that you you all are so much a part of yeah it does feel like um this there is you know even when i moved to new york 15 years ago the amount of uh what do you say more creative music coming out of indian classically trained musicians is you know way more now than even 15 years ago mm -hmm. um like quite a big difference, I would say. Uh, so, you know, it's only telling, you know, no telling, I guess, what's going to happen in the next 20 years. But what's great is, you know, I just think that it, it expands the scope of the music, you know, like, I think it expands the minds of the musicians that are making it. So then, you know, when, when you go back and play traditional music after that, you're informed by all this other stuff. Hmm. So the way you approach the same ragas might also be different. And I think there is something beautiful about that as yeah. well. It's not just about, you know, bringing you know, or, you know, trying to share raga music with people and, and then, you know, to see how we can fit into other styles and how we could merge with different uh, styles and people, but also what it can do for us within our own tradition. I hmm. think there, there's so much growth and evolution that's possible within traditions. Yes. Um, and I'm excited to see, like, I, I see the change in myself as well. You know, it's mm. just in the way I might um, play a phrase, you know, or maybe the, even the way I, I conceive of phrases is maybe a little different now than it was before I started, you know, sort of collaborating more. Yeah. Well, one, a whole other conversation we could have is how Indian classical music is, uh, has, a set of stipulations and regimens and if you will rules although they can be bent that jazz doesn't have really um and so in a way i i turn to jazz for that reason um but uh the different ways that innovation present themselves in different cultures is is a, is another big subject And you just froze up on me. Now, are you there? <laughs> yeah, my my internet is a little. Yeah, I think I froze on you. Sorry about that. Yeah, no, I was just saying that the innovations that happen in different cultures present themselves in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you could speak to this much more than me, but but you know, for Anupam, you know, innovating within traditional Indian classical music is a whole different matter than if he plays metal mm -hmm. or, 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 or participates in a jazz group. So how, how these traditions renew themselves and, and, and come into the modern age is just something that um, we're all witnessing and taking part of. It's very exciting. I think very exciting. So. I think it's a very <laughs> exciting time to be alive. <laughs> yeah, I'd say so. And to be a musician. I mean, look, this could I could never have imagined this happening when I was growing up. That's for sure. Yeah, maybe I did when I was watching the Jetsons or something. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're they're way ahead of us. The Jetsons way ahead. Even the way even ahead. even the Flintstones were ahead of us. So <laughs> I feel that way sometimes. <laughs> It's true. Um, 
have you been are you playing out anywhere um and i guess well one question i have is also how has the pandemic affected you and your music um has it changed from being home and I feel like something in me has changed that I'm still digesting on a practical level. I did a lot of composing. I wrote a lot of solo guitar music and some choral music and a lot of songs. Um, I think it helped me at this stage of my life be clear on my priorities that, um, that the world of performing was very fickle and had so many things in it that we can't control. But the world of composing is, is infinite. Mm -hmm. Can do it anytime, anywhere. All it requires is my imagination. And, you know, what we go through to perform can, can just be a bit arduous. And so when we did, when I wasn't doing it, oddly, I missed it a little less than I thought because I love composing so much. So I, I'm continuing to prioritize that. I'm writing a book of guitar etudes um, and uh, just writing some choral music and I'm gonna start working on a new string quartet and stuff like that. So for me, wow. that's, that's exciting. And- um, That's great. You're writing for a string quartet? Yes, that I've written one string quartet okay. that nobody's heard. So I want to write another <laughs> one. So I'm going to write another one so we can, so we can hear that one. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll put it, I'll put it up on, on Bandcamp. I, I don't know. I, I think it's worth hearing. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a little shy about it. But um, uh, yeah, and, and um, I just have so many different things I want to do. Don't you feel the same way? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I feel like there's a lot of things to do. And sometimes it's not enough time to Never. do it. And, uh, yeah. and then end up doing a quarter of what you thought you might. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I divide my time often into manageable projects that are small, like writing solo guitar music, or whatever, and some of these titanic things like we just heard that are just take years and you kind of have to suffer through and and it never seems like you're you're going to finish and or get what you want out of it i think that's important you know mm -hmm. anthony braxton said that that um you always want to be working on something that's kind of you know relatively practical mm -hmm. and then something that's absolutely impractical this is from the guy who's writing, you know, a five hour opera. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. I kind of love that, you know, because one satisfies this, um, the need to be practical, the need to put stuff out um, and to, to, and to finish, right? You need to start something and finish it. And then you feel like, okay, I did something. But then you also have this other thing, which is like the dream, which is the artistic um, output, maybe that you, you dream of. Yeah, um, it could take time, but it's okay if that takes time. If you're doing other stuff and putting it out, you don't have to feel like, oh my God, this thing has to go out. I can't yeah. spend years on it. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm excited yeah. also because <laughs> Anupama, Anupama and I just recorded an instruction video, instructional video, where we talk about some of the stuff we're talking about, and he's playing and I'm playing and. And so it was nice to try to articulate some of this stuff with him. Um, and it's just being edited now. So we'll see what happens with that. Right. And, you know, one message I want to make clear to listeners. I kind of said this before, and I'll say it again. Um, I always feel a little bit sheepish about talking about Indian music and jazz, because I don't really know that much about Indian music. I mean, I know enough to know what I don't know, which I think is actually pretty important. But I, I hope that those of you who kind of feel that you're 
part of something you really love, but you may not know enough about it to feel secure, will venture forward anyway, because there's ways to involve yourself with other people. You don't have to be a virtuoso in a certain style of music to be able to contribute to it, you know? Absolutely. I don't have to be able to rip one John McLaughlin. Message. Yeah. I don't, I don't need to be able That's to play great. indie music like John McLaughlin to contribute something. And I, I, I kind of lived in that shadow within myself for a while. Um, but there's only so much time, you know? Yeah. What are you going to practice? So at a certain point, you get old, old enough, you go, I'm going to stop worrying about this. Right. I'm just going to do what I can do. And that's when progress happens. Right. That's right. And we're all, we're all different. We're all unique. Each artist has its own voice, their own voice. So um, you can't sound like somebody else, even if you wanted to. You're going to sound like you. <laughs> and that's just what it is. Yeah. Um, but I think it's a great message, honestly, and I think it's to stay curious. Um, and I feel like, you know, with, you know, Indian musicians also, it's like have to know what they don't know, but be curious about it and try stuff out. Um, and only then do you do you really, I think, you know, kind of really learn and grow. So, you know, it's, it's really, um, I got to say, it's been amazing to speak with you and to hear um, one, to hear the music, but to hear your thought process, to kind of hear your humbleness and modesty for being, you know, for being such an incredible musician as you are and composer. Um, I really respect your approach to it. And um, it's, it's really beautiful to listen to you speak about it. And, uh, you know, I strive for similar things. A lot of musicians, I think, could take, you know, just the attitude goes so far, like it'll take you far if you believe that, you know, you don't know what you don't know. You go out there, you try, you try to take things yeah. in from other musicians, surround yourself with good artists and good people and good things happen. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it's, a, for me, it's about being like a field marshal. Okay. <laughs> I've got the troops massed. I've got to tell them where to attack. <laughs> you know you yeah. the, the the whole if you if you have that uh, that idea and you get the right people in the room and know sort of what to say and what not to say that's a huge thing yeah when i was younger i would say too much you know try to tell somebody what to do yeah. well come on really you're going to tell a master african musician what to do no you got to let them be them right. you're going to tell Selva Ganesh, what to do? I don't think so. You have mm -hmm. to set him up in a way that will make him happy. Mm -hmm. And then he'll just do his thing. Totally. And, and the, the list goes on. Totally. Um, like that. And, and I place myself in the music where I can do what I can do. And I don't try to do stuff I can't do. Well, amazing. It's been really great, Joel. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you. For joining us and for sharing so much with us. Um, it's really been wonderful. And do you have any concerts? Are you playing out uh, anytime soon? And you know, your website, I believe is what, joelharrison.com? Harrison yep. joelharrison.com. And you know, you mentioned many different things that you're gonna be putting out, like, I mean, the string quartet, which I'm curious about, um, but you, right, uh, you're doing these videos with Anupam, you're making a book of etudes, so for so well, I just released a book actually called Guitar Talk, with, which is interviews with 27 visionary guitarists. Amazing. That's what I did over the pandemic. I forgot. I wrote a book. I, I, over three years, I interviewed 27 guitarists from Ben Monner to Pat Metheny to Rafik Bhatia to Rez. And, um, wow. and, and it, that, that's available, Guitar Talk. You can get it from Amazon or Barnes & Noble. I started a record label, AGS Records, you know, like BRM yeah. Records. You know, I said, well, I, I guess I, I have to. I've been sort of, we're all kind of end up feeling that we have stuff that we want to put out by other people and ourselves that may not find a label. So I've done that, just released a du record of guitar duos and, and a record by Anthony Pirog, the guitarist. And um, we're going to do a, a bit of a record release for that sep September 2nd at Soapbox. So, um, okay. I mean, other than just kind of casual gigs here and there, um, playing jazz standards or whatever, that's my first original music uh, gig since 
March of 2020 or whenever it was, 2000, yeah. you know, yeah. 1850 or uh, <laughs> not long ago. Yeah. Uh, so September 2nd will be, be the first time I'll do that. And I do have one of those Dora Stoop tours planned for the South um, that got postponed by a year. And we'll see, I think that's gonna happen in October uh, with my group that integrates country music and jazz. That's a whole other thing we could have talked about, but um, yeah. uh, um, that was a lot easier than integrating Indian music. Let me tell you <laughs> something, it really was. You know, all, all, all you need is a... You know, country music and Indian music sometimes go nicely, like bluegrass and Carnatic music. Oh man, I've heard about that. I never, I heard, I heard one thing with Swami Selvaganesh doing that online. It blew my mind. Some Indian guy playing bluegrass, playing uh, incredible bluegrass. Yeah, you, you got to send me some of that stuff if you hear it. I mean, I haven't really ever heard it to be honest. But me and Trina do a lot of duo stuff, and sometimes I'm like, oh my god. Oh, this and then we get into like a fiddle tune. We'll do like Jerusalem Bridge or something. Listen, when and I was at, on it, and it's like, yeah, when I was at the Ali Akbar Khan school a little bit, when I lived out there, Bruce Ham, the Sirode player, who yeah, was very well known out there, would play bluegrass on the Sirode, and it was mind blowing. Yeah, I bet. All I this bet. Is, it's just waiting to happen. Somebody's going to do it. There's somebody doing it already. <laughs> there is. We just don't know where they are. We just don't know it exactly. And you know, it's it's uh, yeah. You got you got the gears whirling here. I think that you know that could be the next country project. You you better <laughs> we'll look, we'll start, look out start, for that. start listening. Start listening yeah. to that Kenny Baker Arun. I may call you yeah. in to. Uh, I, we might have to make this happen now. <laughs> uh, yeah. All right, Joel. Well, thanks again. Thank I think uh, we might be out of time, but this okay. was this was awesome, man. Appreciate yeah. it. Talk to you soon. Thanks, everyone. Yes. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Um, you know, we're going to be back again next week. Um, let me see who's coming next week. I'm gonna check it, check it, check it. Neil Moore Guy, the one and only Neil Moore Guy, is going to do a workshop next Tuesday, and then the following Tuesday after that is. Kauru Watanabe, who is an incredible um, musician, taiko drummer, playing Japanese flutes, um, also coming, you know, mixing worlds of jazz and uh, traditional Japanese music. Um, really great musician, good friend. So uh, stay tuned for all these great workshops. And uh, just so you know, we are also really trying to get back to our uh, jam session in person which we're hoping to do and announce something sometime next month. Um, but yes, cross your fingers. We can start hanging out again and playing in person. So stay tuned for that as well. Um, all right. Yeah. And uh, thanks again, Joel. And uh, good night, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Good, good night. night.